Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. As in the recent news, all that basically changed is that we ha we now have news that Ukrainian soldiers in the Donbas front are, well, suffering really bad, and there are pro probably some cases of desertion, not as big as in the Russian army, but still, and that the fights have been, you know, increasingly strong with artillery shelling on both sides. There haven't been really any much movements to, to go through. I'll go through kind of the bigger political issues because apparently China have now decided to not allow Airbus and Boeing planes which were stolen by Russian government at the beginning of this war as a response to the sanctions to enter China's airspace. So that's going to be interesting and there are some other things, but today I'm doing some of my back tax. You see, a while ago I, um, I made an episode where I compared the, the blog post about the soldier on the ground with what Putin's, Putin's daughter says. And I thought this would be, this as I'm preparing for more news stuff to come on, because, you know, if previously we thought in days and there were active events, then now, well, not that much is happening, but um, we have some cool possible ideas about what could get on with, with all the situation, because we obviously want this war to end. Well then, you know, today I wanted to bring you part 3 to part 5, which have been finally translated by Dmitry of wartranslated.com. And I just wanted to finish this one out and give you the whole whole story of this Russian soldier that wrote a blog post about about a, a some time that he spent on the front lines there. So if you haven't if you haven't listened to the the first part of this, either um, please go back and um, and listen to our episode. I think it was the one about people's stories. It's a very recent one. Because uh, right now we're not going to be recapping parts 1 and 2, because, well, <laughs> we already did that, and uh, I hope that this also gives you some food for thought. Part 3. I consider it important to say how the humanitarian aid collected for our army is distributed. Even back home, I suspected that the very little reaches the front line directly. Back in my unit in Valyuki, I found that conscripts who were delivering humanitarian aid to our unit in Ukraine stole it, fr stole, stole it from three crates of canned meat and sold it in our unit for 70 rubles each. They also stole three crates with cigarettes. Cigarettes that normally cost 187 rubles, they were selling for 100. I also personally saw how in the regiment's headquarters, a woman who worked there was eating Russian candy from a big crate. As far as I understand, that was meant to go straight to the front lines, but it never did. One can only wonder how many crates like that with sweets, canned food, condensed milk are stolen in the Valyuk unit by every man and his dog. People who saw it also told me how in Izium, those who always stayed in the rears jumped like jackals at crates with aid from some Russian regions. The aid was also meant for the front lines. They pulled out and gutted everything. They took all the chocolate, canned foods, good cigarettes and all the good clothing. They left out all the worst and unneeded, including the worst cigarettes. In the end, from a whole truck, only three crates survived. One was sent to our 752nd uh, Regiment, another to Bogichari, and they, showed the lo they shoved the last one somewhere. Those who saw these rear, rear bastards going through items said it was a very disgusting thing to see from outside. I was at the front line. Thank God we always had food but never had good cigarettes. They simply never reached us. We didn't have basic raincoats either. When it rained heavily for three days and we all were soaked, we slept soaked, we stood guard soaked. Oh, on a side note, yeah, this is uh, also reported by current events as well, because sadly the Ukrainian counterattack on Severodonetsk was pushed back, but currently the logistics situation for the Russian army has been already become extremely strained, and now people are complaining about not even having food or, or good clothing, so this, this comes from times when the situation was considered even, you know, like a bit better off. It's important to note other tragic issue. Many, many volunteer guys got scattered around the forest after those insane assaults by our unit. They fled because they were immediately thrown into battle and they didn't even know each other all that well. I've heard they now wander in the forest in small groups, not letting anyone approach them. If someone yells at them, we're yours, they start shooting anyway. What was it like for these people? Wandering around the forest, cold and hungry, always afraid of getting into the hands of these Ukrainian subhumans. Who will answer for this? Yeah, and of course, Russian Russian uh, maniacs always call Ukrainians subhuman. That's a bit scary. Carrying on. In early May, I found that one of our private military corporations had an objective of collecting such people in the forests and fields of our area. Well, this is probably an accompanying task for them. Aside from that, I think their main objective is fighting Ukrainian saboteurs. 
They picked up two, our, two of our guys in Shrubbery near, near Sugilovka. They fed them, gave them uniforms since after two weeks in Sugilovka, their uniform completely worn out and brought them to Izium. Another thing, in early May, two FSB officers came to us, a major and a lieutenant. I, be, I believe they were from the FSB Department for Armed Forces. I don't know if they belong to this division or not. They were very polite. They tried very, very politely to return us to the front line. I said that we are basically thrown into a senseless slaughter. The lieutenants said they knew all of this. I said it wasn't just us who refused to assault Dolgen Koya. The Spetsnaz also refused to assault this village. He answered that they know and they are working on it as well. He said, we do not judge any of you who refused. He said it multiple times. Then, on the May 6th, the FSB colonel arrived. One fellow said that he heard him talking about us. Quote, groups of 20 people are thrown into attacks like meat. I just don't understand how this makes sense. If FSB knows about all this, why aren't they talking any measures throughout this horror? Or is that considered normal? Or is it just how it often happens in Russia? Everyone's covering each other's ass since they're all friends, comrades, relatives, drinking buddies, cold thieves, and so on. For instance, this FSB colonel's daughter could be married or in a relationship with my former division commander's son. So the case is not moving. So sad, of course. It's also important to note I have personally heard how in the regional contract selection office one of the instructors was blatantly lying to a grown man that they needed a driver to chauffeur the division commander, having previously found whether he had a B or C driving license level. He did it because no one wanted to be a driver since they were very often killed. Also, speaking to guys from other regions of Russia, I found that many were told in the enlistment offices that they would not be serving on the front lines, but will be the second echelon troops guarding checkpoints, escorting convoys, guarding cities and villages in the rears already taken by us. Although I clearly realized I could end up on the front line, including the assault group. Also, some, myself included, were told we will be in the Ukraine from two weeks to a month, and then we'd be taken out to Russia for day ten days to rest. But that also was a lie. Specifically, in our division there was no rotation. Volunteers in our contract entered Ukraine on 24th of February. Yeah, they're still, they, they still are there and never left Russia. Same for us. If we stayed, we would be there until the end of our contract, so half a year until September. Those volunteer contractors who came after us, many of them, if not all, did not even pass the medical examination. When I came back home, I watched a few videos with Igor Strelkov. He spoke in particular about the criminal mobilization that was concluded in LPR and DPR when people without any proper training or, or, a bit to tra or, or coordination were sent into battle. He said they didn't even do this in the first, most difficult months of the Great Patriotic War. People were given at least a bit of time to train and get to know each other, at least one week. Since if it's not done, this leads to massive losses. And this leads to large losses of the mobilized in Donetsk and Lugansk, Strelkov said. For a mobilization like this, uh, those in leadership who allowed it must be shot, Strelkov said. Oh yeah, Strelkov, by the way, is another name for Igor Girkin, except that he likes Strelkov, so I just use his official name, Girkin. He also said that such mobilization kills the Golden Fund of Russia, since those who did not hide from enlistment officers are the most decent and honest people. He also said that this treatment where people are sent to slaughter, runs all the, ruins all the motivation for people to serve and help mo motherland in the future. As I realized, we were unlucky as we ended up in the most brutal unit, which was always thrown into hell. It's important to note that I often spoke to and saw in Sugilovka the motorized regiment from our division, 252nd, which however was based in B Bugarhi in Vol Vol Volonyz Oblast. My opinion is that this regiment was two to three times more combat ready and trained than ours. Why so? I don't know. The regiment's losses were three to four times less than ours. 80% of all volunteers, as I understood, were thrown into our regiment due to the fact that we've had huge losses and always had an acute shortage of people. Also, one good contractor guy from that regiment, also named Victor, said that our division has a messed up artillery. I asked why, why is our soil artillery so bad and so ill prepared, he said photo reports. They don't shoot properly, just take photos and write that all is well, all the targets have been successfully hit. Also, another guy from reconnaissance talked how they spotted in Sugilovka area a Ukrainian hovitzer which was shelling Sugilovka. It was spotted in the morning. Its precise coordinates were provided. The scout said it was shelling Su Sugilovka the whole day and not a single scum from our artillery hit it, even though there's plenty of art artillery stationed among shrubbery. It was exactly during the days when I was in Sugilovka. I also remember one time when we were shelled throughout the whole day but our artillery was silent. How so? I don't know. Perhaps no one had ammunitions. It's important to note that our helicopters helped us a couple of times. On two occasions, they suppressed enemy mortars that were very close to us, around one and a half kilometers away, who hit us when we were in Sugilovka. The same scout were saying that we often don't have proper communication and interaction between battalion and regiment, and regiment and division. If true, this is horrible, of course. 
Our division Zampoliet once spoke to us after we refused to go into assaults. He tried to persuade us to go back to the front lines and attacks. Do you know what struck me? He was confident we all came to fight in Ukraine for money, and that, it, it, then, then that if any of us was making more than 120,000 rubles a month in Russia, then we wouldn't come here. What can be said about this? It is of course sad when there are Zampolites like that in Russia, who are confident that people can have no motivation other than material beliefs, material benefits. In fact, as I understand, this is what all the high-ranking officers in battalion, regiment, division believed, apart from company commanders who went into attacks with us on the front lines. Well, they're probably judged by themselves, as I see it. In reality, there is nothing, nothing surprising about it. This has been going on for a while in the Russian society. On the first place for the mass majority of, of the people of Russia are material goods, flats, cars, cottages, cruises abroad. Even though I was a child, I very well remember how people were in the early 2000s. It was a different society in Russia. There are many times more kind, humane, sincere people. These days you can be incredibly kind, decent, honest and sincere, but if you have no money, no success, then you are seen in the Russian society as a complete nobody. Part 4 Days before going back to Russia, I spoke to one grown-up man from Lipetsk. He was also a volunteer, a driver. I told him that many volunteers just sincerely came to help and not for money, for, but for an idea. He said, kindly, so you're saying for an idea? So what they've done to your idea? They just pissed on it. And sadly, this is true. This man knew very well how we were sent to attack on groups of 40, 50, 60 people. He said that 40 people is not an attack. He said that generally everyone realized that you first need to destroy strong points of Ukrainian army with aviation, artillery, missiles, and only then send a mass infantry attack from multiple directions towards Dolyankoye. Then it would be a success. We've had different people, of course. There were cunning and savvy people who came just just for the money and to receive a combat veteran certificate. And they were coming being, being sure they'll be in safety, somewhere in the rears and checkpoints. There were also fine and decent people, but still came to earn 300 to 400,000 rubles in a month. There were also many of those who were first and foremost coming to help and not for the money. It's obvious that almost everyone needs money, but for this category of people, money and subsidies were of a secondary value and in, and in many ways not important or needed. I was told how one of the volunteers who was in our first company, Pasha from Moscow region, he was attached to us of, of 19th of April before the attack, who at first joined the attacks, but after two or three he refused. Now he raised our battalion commander. Do you think we are just meat? You keep sending us to death and never going to attack yourself. It's important to note that Mayor Vashura, who was commanding in Sugilovka, was staying in front of the formation that he would shoot legs of those who refused to go and attack. I shouted at him from my formation that it was illegal, that it was lawless. He didn't respond with anything and moved on from the topic of shooting the legs. It is just my opinion that battalion commanders need to be near their units. If the battalion is going to attack, then the battalion commander needs to attack and not sit out in a BTR or a basement. For instance, together with us in Sugilovka, there was the Sakhalin Motorized Brigade. They had 40 people holding the fence 500 meters from Sugilovka. The Ukrainian army attacked them. They reported they were under attack. The battalion commander got into a BTR with 22 people and went there to help and stayed with them for two days. This, this is a real commander. When troops sense that the commander is with them, when they feel they are valued and protected, then they'll fight to death. What is there to stay, say when our commander was telling us directly, swearing, that he didn't give a shit about us? Proper officers and generals always cared and respected the simple soldier, since it's simple soldiers who bear the brunt and difficulties of the war. Zhukov realized that, and Suvorov and Kutuzov and Rokosovsky and many other decent officers realized that. Right now, in my opinion, a good officer is the Vostok Donetsk Battalion com Commander Alexander Khodokovsky. He can complete, competently organize attacks. I've heard a lot of terrible things from those who went into attacks after us. They said when you approach Dolinkoye, very close to it, there are bodies of our dead soldiers lying around. Some have already begun decomposing and swelling back then. Some also said they saw bodies of our dead piled up in shrubbery, somewhere also tied to the trees. Perhaps those are the wounded who are abused and tortured. Who will respond for this? Who? They said our wounded were in one, one of the trenches for three days and no one could pick them up. Even the Ferencata sons couldn't uh, pick them up. Then they heard how the Banderites, as they like to call the Ukrainians, walked along the trenches at night, shouting, Russian, surrender! And single shots could be heard. As you understand, they were finishing off the wounded. But they also said that they saw how once our guys got captured and were walked across the field by the Banderites. Ours, ours decided to strike, the, strike all of them with, with 80 GMs, both ours and Ukrainians, just so ours wouldn't get captured and tortured. In my opinion, that was the right thing to do. It's better to die instantly like that, like that than being, be, be tortured for days uh, in the hands of these inhumans. Again, everyone in Russia seems to think that Ukrainians are all inhuman, because they actually haven't spoken to a real Ukrainian. 
It's important to note that despite the horror and insanity, and insanity of our attacks in the 752nd Regiment, still 10-20% to 20 of volunteers have stayed. In my opinion, these are very strong and courageous people. A vivid example I can bring the, se the senior, Praparashik from our company, Vladimir. He joined all the, all the attacks. He took part in five and didn't get wounded. Moreover, he was 42 years old and he was far from athletic. He had a significant extra weight, at least the last time I saw him. In my opinion, people like that are real men, and it's very sad they are used like that, sent to senseless attacks. Generally, it's important to note that despite everything, there were many people from the Western and Eastern military districts with whom I spoke, and who had a high fighting spirit, and the desire to fight till the end. The desire and readiness to crush these banderites come till the very end, that's a fact. I realize a war and casualties are inevitable. I'm ready to join the attacks, but only when the attacks make sense. Yes, if a unit loses 20-40% to 40 is killed or wounded, but captures the indicated position as it was originally with the capabilities of, its, of this unit. The unit wasn't thrown at a position that was impossible to capture to start with. I understand when after a successful yet difficult assault, the unit with many fresh newcomers is given several days, if not a week, to rest, recover and not be thrown into another assault of another area the next day. Another story I was told. Eight helicopters were given an order to strike the enemy positions. Only two of the eight helicopters took off. Officers were either broken, others were either broken or had no fuel. Only one of the helicopters successfully fired at the objective. Not all the targets were hit, or in fact 80% of the targets were not hit. Yet this operations commander reported to the leadership that all is well and all the targets were hit. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think that yes it is. Note, he probably means th that the report to leadership said all objectives were hit. And I understand how these huge losses of human lives and vehicles can happen. Do you want to know how? The superior commander believes that if all the targets were hit, then he can send infantry with tanks to assault this area. As a result, infantry with tanks moves out and gets shelled with every weapon possible. As I figured out, the Eastern Military District is, is many times more combat ready than the Western Military District. Their losses were much smaller when they were near Kiev and Chernigov than what the Western District had in Kharkiv and Izium. This is my understanding. They also have way more vehicles as I see it. Why is there such a stark difference in the ability to fight between the districts? Can't tell you, I don't know that. Although, again, I spoke to different people. The Eastern Military District also had significant losses. They are also thrown into assaults. But I don't think their attacks are as hopeless and insane as they were in our 752nd Regiment. Part 5. It should be noted that one of our guys in Izium overheard how they were planning to decide our fate. He heard what one of the FSB agents was telling other officers. He said they were looking at several options. Apart from terminating the contract and sending us to Russia, they wanted to use some of us to film TikTok videos to show how great it is to be a volunteer at war to attract new volunteers. Also, another FSB colonel was suggesting taking us out at night and shooting five people each time so that the others would agree to go into attacks. The FSB agents said they were looking at this colonel with rounded eyes, thinking, is he insane or something? Generally, this topic of shootings has always been in the air, and many were really, really afraid of this. Apart from Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Vashura, who was in Sugilovka, and was saying he would shoot the legs of those who refused to attack, our 752nd Regiment Zampolitanizium was firing from an assault rifle near the feet of those who refused to join assaults. By that time, they've had around 30 people like that. He preemptively took away our weapons from those who had them. But, uh, but it should also be noted that some were saying the opposite. Let them shoot, it's better to die here. At least the complete body will be passed to relatives so that they could bury us properly. And it's better to get torn apart the, it's better than to get torn apart with a bomb and rot in the trench, or even worse, end up in these Ukrainians as, as a capture. Also important to note, those who fought in the Second Chechen or Syrian Wars said that compared to Ukraine, those were a child's play. In Ukraine, it was ten times tougher. On the morning of 8th of May, we left to Russia. By midday, we were already there. Our contracts were terminated right in front of our unit. In Valyoki, in the evening of 8th of May, we were approached by a man, a gas tanker driver from the Central Military District attached to the 3rd Motorized Division. He said his division had no gas tankers, so many gas tanker drivers were attached to this division. I said, uh, I said they must have taken away the gas tankers from this division to start, at the start of the war. He said, no, they were initially non-functional in this division. I thought to myself, how is it possible that a division stationed 20-40 kilometers from the border has no working gas tankers? How is it possible at all? This man was a very good man, very courageous. They also had huge losses. He said they, when they stay in Izium for two weeks, then go, then go back to Russia for a few days to get fuel, they often get shelled with grads and Tochka too. He said they move in columns and 20-40 to 40 vehicles without any cover. It happened that they were shelled with grads right on the road. They brought radios from their own money, and stayed in touch this way. They once got shelled on their way, everyone started quickly moving away from the road. Only 20 kilometers later, they all managed to get together again thanks to the radios. 
Two gas tankers were hit that time. He also said that recently they picked up from Donbas militias a BTR with no wheels. They fixed it up and now for the first time on 9th of May they will have a BTR going with them as cover. Maybe they'll find another two, two to three BTRs somewhere. When I was in Ukraine, several military people told me that the plan was to take Ukraine in four days. What can be said about this? Whoever planned it is a genius, in air quotes. If initially around 220,000 of our troops entered Ukraine, then it's too little for lightning fast defeat of the army and capture of Kiev southeast of Ukraine in its central part. In my opinion, we need at least 600,000 trained troops for that. Then it could have possibly worked, but unfortunately what happened, happened. Due to the fact that catastrophically few people entered to complete this initial plan, we've had such huge losses at the very beginning of hostilities. These losses are all covered up by our authorities, as many people say. And more often than not, those were the best, most fearless and prepared that, that, that were dying. After all, who would normally go at the very vanguard of an attacking group or a column? The commanders and the best prepared, the strongest fighters. Do you know what else is scary? That the federal channels in Russia are saying that everything is going great at the front lines, that the special operation is going according to plan. My opinion is that it is often a vile, impudent and disgusting lie. Far from everything is going by the plan. Due to the constant lies, I do not believe a single word that these creatures are saying in the federal media. I also do not believe any more a single word from the official Russian authorities, neither Peskov nor any other characters. My opinion is that in Russia they destroyed any critique of the authorities. I believe this is not normal and is wrong. There must be a critique as it shows the authorities all the mistakes and shortcomings. But there is no criticizing the authorities in Russia. Who will answer for thousands of our wounded and killed soldiers in Ukraine? Who will answer for the hundreds of tortured guys in capture? Who? Who will answer for throwing us into this into insane, useless suicidal attacks? My opinion is that if Russia now had generals like Zhukov, Suvorov, Rukosovsky, Kutuzov, it would all be different. Any decent, decent officer cares and protects ordinary soldiers because he understands that, first of all, on their shoulders, their lives, their health, their dedication, their efforts, all victories in any war are, are achieved. Uh, I can tell you that this guy probably doesn't really know much about the Second World War because, oh boy, telling that Zhukov cared about his soldiers is, uh, well, putting very blatantly extremely not true, but that's just coming from me carrying on. Regarding this war and whether it should have been started or not, that's a different topic. War is always terrible and must be avoided at all costs. But the fact that Ukraine shelled the peaceful population of Donbass for eight years, that's a 100% fact in my opinion. And in everyone else's opinion who has some brain cells, that is a blatant lie because that was just spread by the same propaganda machine that this blog post author now believes 100%. So, yeah, this is why I hate stupid people. Carrying on. As well as the fact that Ukrainian army could attack Donbass and Crimea. Yeah, they could, but they never did. Also true, in my opinion, is that the United States could place in Kharkiv the nuclear missiles that could reach Moscow in 5-7 to seven minutes. While using nuclear weapons on civilian cities is nothing new for the United States. We can remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And again, a little comment of this guy, because this was written before um, Sweden and Finland joined NATO. You know, travel time from Riga to Moscow of nukes also isn't that great, and now the situation is far worse. But, aside from all this, it's important to note that even before the war, there were in Ukraine many angry, evil and stupid people who cannot put two words together without swearing, if they can be called people at all, who hated Russians and said, th said they should be killed. And the ideas of Bandera and Nazism are very strong in Ukraine. In the fact, the official authorities in Ukraine since 2014 were constantly saying that Ukraine is at war with Russia. And, yeah, those people were totally right, because how can you call it when some other country annexes your, like, Crimea? But that's, again, my comments, it's just that, uh, this this stupidity where, um, where, where such people post their other bullshit propaganda machine... Uh, it drives me to make some comments, but you know what? I won't. Because you, if you listen to this show for a while, you know that it's all bullshit and you probably don't need my comments. You'd rather get me back to the story. Just listen to the previous episodes and you'll understand. Carrying on. And all the politics in Ukraine were pro banderite and aimed at destroying everything in, in Russian in Ukraine. Language, culture, people who had positive attitudes towards Russia. Also, my opinion is that the way our captives are abused, maimed, killed, only scum is capable of this, not people. Such subhumans must be destroyed physically. This is my opinion, which is exactly why I went to that war and I'm ready now to continue to fight and destroy these degenerates. Just not with the command that we've had. It's important to know that in Ukraine, like in any other country, there are many good, kind and peaceful people who are far from politics and just want to have a peaceful and happy life. Happy life. Since 2014, I've been watching on YouTube a Ukrainian politician, a blogger and journalist, Anatoly Shari, 
<clears throat> Again, this requires a comment of mine. That guy's a pedophile and he's been arrested in Spain and I hope they literally stop him into prison because he's a major asshole who also predicted Kyiv would fall in two days and spread this information. But... <sighs> Again, I'll just finish this stuff because this propaganda nonsense, it hurts my brain. And the journalist Olesha Medvedeva. So even without being in Ukraine, I knew quite well what was happening there. Because you believe people's lies. In general, my opinion is that all wars start in people. Humanity in general are losing humanity. They turn evil, cunning, lying and disgusting. Also, my opinion is that modern media are very much to blame for the current war and the situation in the world in general. They often lie and say what is beneficial to the powerful of this world. Many tragedies of this life happen because of this. My opinion is that Anatoly Shari and Olesh Medvedev can be considered the gold standard of journalism. They always objectively present the information, and as people, they are incredibly kind, bright and sincere. And this comes from me, I believe they should be shot and maybe tortured even because I hate them with terrible passion because they are anything but kind, bright and sincere and they are, well, basically journalism that you can throw in the trash bag. Oh, God. I really want as many people as possible to read this article and find out about the real state of affairs at the front line. And I really want this article to be read by the com Commander-in-Chief Vladimir Putin. Because this author is clearly stuck into the Tsar is good, boyars are bad mentality and haven't really even, you know, learned anything. I'm trying to reach out to the Komsomoyska Pravda editorial. Maybe they'll publish it. No, I'll be trying to contact foreign publications. Maybe they will publish it. People need to know the truth. I had thoughts to contact the presidential administration, the FSB director, the military prosecution. But even before the war, I had to come across our law enforcement agencies. I don't believe them, and I don't trust them to deal with anything according to the law, according to the justice. No one gives a damn. Everything I've written, I wrote sincerely. I saw everything with my own two eyes, or was told by witnesses of various events. I hope that our valiant law enforcement won't initiate any criminal proceeding against me. I do not give away any secrets or locations of our troops. And also, since the end of April and early May, when I was in Ukraine, over a week has passed. The operational disposition of our forces has already changed. And the fact that in our army, the criminal idiocy is happening at the front lines, they know that in the Ukrainian army. Our scouts said they heard in radio interceptions how the Ukrainian military were laughing their asses off talking about our army. Quote, well, this is the glorified Russian army. And yeah, I would be laughing as well. Also, a big question is whether the political leadership of the country and our army have been preparing for all these eight years starting from 2014. For what? Do they expect that our army will be greeted in Ukraine with flowers and salt and bread? Answer, yes, yes they did. If you've listened to my show, then you know that. Then finally, my opinion is that this war could be won in many respects with high-quality strike zones alone if we had one, two, three thousand of them. And there would not have been such huge losses. Phew. This got really difficult at the end, guys. This was difficult because when someone starts spewing such nonsense, it, it really grinds my gears. At any rate... Well, now you have the whole complete story, and I don't want to. I don't want to be making like kind of stupid, tinier episodes. I'll, I'll try to go into detail with more important stuff. But I promised you I'd finish this, and well, here we go. If you can, please support us on Patreon, Patreon.com/EasternBorder, or just click the little monetary icon on our Twitter profile, which we're still trying to grow to twenty thousand. Our Twitter is at Eastern underscore Border. Or just, you know, if you paid the ads and, and want to donate our, uh, and help our show with one-time payment, you can just listen to our episodes in the eastern border.lv. No ads there, and there's a little, you know, donate to us button on the right side, which goes toward emergency fund, because all the Patreon goes on to our, you know, when my arm is finally fixed in a week or so, I'll start planning the next trip to Ukraine. At any rate, I really hope you enjoyed the show. Oh, and uh, I also was interviewed by History Impossible, the night, the last night. I'm when they ever publish this episode, I'll of course mention this, and it's gonna go pretty well. I hope. At any rate, thank you for listening. До свидания, товарищи. And as always, remember, happiness is mandatory.